Hello everybody, today we're going to do an unscheduled follow-up to the previous video about the PM5644. Since I put that out, there's been a rather interesting development. I was contacted by David Myers from Australia, who I was already aware of because he has a PM5544, but what I didn't know is just how many other generators he has. There is no such thing as too many test pattern generators around here. Now unfortunately, he doesn't have what I was looking for in the previous video, but he does have something else that I've been looking for, and that is a production version of this Power Plus generator here. Now for those unaware, Power Plus is a complicated extension to PAL, which allows widescreen content to be viewed on 4x3 televisions, which don't have a built-in letterboxing feature. It has various other features as well, which we will talk about in an actual video about Power Plus. And by the way, that is not what today's video is going to be about. So what is the big deal about finding a production version of this? Well, allow me to demonstrate. So when I power this on, we, if you have a look down here, the version number 000.1, it's just, just a really, very low number, and frankly, it doesn't really inspire a whole lot of confidence. You know, for a production version of something, you'd expect to see at least a version one. Now, this thing was, appears to have been sold before the Power Plus specification was actually finalized. It belonged to Thompson, not in a TV factory, but it was actually used in their R&D division. Now, Thompson were part of the Power Plus working group, so it's possible that this unit was circulated fairly early on as a part of the development of Power Plus itself, which is, makes it quite interesting. But from my perspective, where I just want to make a video about Power Plus, well, I don't really feel like I can depend on this. And there are a few unusual things about its output, which I will now demonstrate. So we're running now through this Power Plus decoder, and superficially everything looks okay, but if we look at these boxes here, where I would expect to see diagonal lines, instead we have this kind of checker pattern effect. And I'm not really sure what to make of it. And I had to look around on the web and on YouTube, and all of the off-air captures of Power Plus circle patterns, which you know, in most cases have come from this piece of equipment, they don't look like this. They have the diagonal lines as I would expect. Now, I'm not really sure whether or not this is not decoding it correctly, or is, or it's just because this is how the pattern in this unit is designed. And I'm not because I can't really change anything here. I have no way to know for sure. So that's one of the reasons why I'm really interested in upgrading the, the software in this thing. Now this Power Plus decoder here was kindly donated to me by a viewer in the Netherlands, and I really appreciate this because for some reason, when somebody has one of these to sell, they seem to think that they can slap a 500 euro price tag on it, and I'm really baffled as to why anybody would you know, contemplate paying so much money for it, and frankly, I don't think anybody ever has. Uh, the Power Plus signal is a very unlikely thing to come by these days, unless, unless you happen to have one of these generators. Uh, the only other place you would find one is on a, a laser disc. Um, but personally, I would probably rather spend my money on an anamorphic version of that laser disc rather than be hobbled by Power Plus. Anyway, because there is now the prospect of upgrading the software in this in this unit, what we're going to do is whip the lid off it and see what we're dealing with here. So when I first took the lid off the Power Plus generator, I was quite surprised by the inside of it. Number one, just the sheer number of EEPROMs that it contains. And also just the, the generator PCB here is quite unusual. We have these blank spots where it kind of looks like there was supposed to be components, but there aren't for some reason. Back in the previous video, I talked about the HDTV generator, which is a mysterious piece of equipment. None, none of them appear to be surviving. Um, but it, uh, what I mentioned was that this thing is a variation of the HDTV generator. If we were to open the, the lid of that thing, what we would find is that the power supply, gen lock and sync board here on this side is going to be exactly the same. And the generator board on this side will be very similar, the same down this end. But up, up the back here, we would have components in these, in these empty spots. So there would be three DACs and three output filter networks. And in the rear of these two composite output connectors, there would be four, four connectors, so these, these blanks would be filled, so they would be sync. Y, PB, and PR. Uh, and there would also be a, a D sub connector here as well, D, DB25, I think. Uh, and that, that's a digital output, so you can get the data um, before it goes into the DAX for some reason or other. Now, I really have no idea how that piece of equipment is actually used in practice. And there's another blank here. This is for the GPIB control interface. I do have a few of these in other pieces of equipment, but not on this one. Not really all that interesting in this thing anyway, because not a lot you can actually do with it. Now, for this upgrade, what we have to do is reprogram most of the chips in here. And David has supplied code for, for all of the EEPROMs. But unfortunately, it's not just about EEPROMs. There are other chips in here as well, like PALs, programmable array logic chips. 
He's only in possession of a Chinese programmer, unfortunately, and the deal basically is that you generally can't really work with PALs in a Chinese programmer. Even if they say they support it, they probably don't in practice. What they what they might have done is use the algorithm for a lattice gal like this one. These do work in Chinese programmers, and they've just assumed that it's the same as a PAL, which it isn't, so it's not going to work. And I would never recommend that anybody put one of these devices into a Chinese programmer either, because there's actually a possibility of damaging it. Now, another 5644 owner I dealt with, he actually posted me the PALs from his unit so I could read them out, which was really, really bold, and I really appreciated that, so I read, read them out for him and sent them back and put them up on my, um, on my GitHub. But in, in this particular case, um, you know, David being based in Australia, I, I, I don't really want to do that if I can avoid it. So what, what we did is we went through and compared all of the PALs in his units um, with mine, and we found that they are all the same except for one, this one here. So the next job is to try and work out what exactly might be different about this chip to see if we can just adapt the code in mine to become the same as his without actually having to physically see his one. The PAL is part of this circuit here, the H counter stroke logic decoder, kind of a vague description, but uh, I think what we have here is something that we see in other generators, which is uh, basically is a counter which is implemented across several PALs, so two, maybe even a third one, one there. The one that has changed is this one here, um, V47, um, apparently in Denmark, um, they say V instead of U for a chip, I'm not sure why that is. Um, uh, but what we need to be looking at here is the, the outputs of it. Um, it has uh, four, four outputs of particular interest here, um, in addition to the counter outputs. Uh, the counter outputs we probably wouldn't really pay much attention to because the uh, all it's going to be doing is counting, and eventually this counter will roll over, and when it does so, it will assert the carry signal. So in terms of the actual counting, the only thing I need to look at is the carry signal. Um, but there's all these other signals on here, and they go to the various different places. Uh, two of them I found actually go over to the sync and um, power supply board, and they come into this circuit here, uh, gen lock control, and this is like a phase shifting kind of arrangement. Uh, one of them is this one here, clock 9, so presumably that's a 9 megahertz clock, well that's not going to have changed. And the other one here is this one called odd, which is, um, this is, appears to be an odd even field indicator. Once again, that's not going to have changed, so I think we can rule those two out. So that leaves us with two remaining signals that we want to look at. Um, carry, so the, the rollover of this counter may have changed, so all we need to do is measure uh, when carry is actually asserted to check that. And the other one is uh, this LDCH off, and this uh, comes over to here to these latches, and this is to use to shift data from the microcontroller into the generator circuitry at a specific time. So I think I think that um, the the changes is going to be one of these one of these two signals. So what I'm what I'm, what I'm going to do is um, just email David to ask him if he can just attach these chips to uh, this chip to a scope, and, and synchronize it with the horizontal sync, and, and we'll see when when these are actually asserted. See, see if we can spot any differences um, with mine. Now the other there is another um, potential uh, banana peel in, in upgrading this thing here, and. That is this microcontroller on here. Uh, this um, this is a Dallas Speedit Mu P. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> this is a this is an 8051 compatible microcontroller. Um, it 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 executes 8051 binary code, but the architecture of it is actually completely different. Uh, in, in it's able to execute the code four times faster than a conventional 8051. Uh, the the market target market for these things was companies that had a large assembler code base and they they want to they want a bit more horsepower but they don't they don't want to go rewriting all of their code so you could you could use one of these in that case and I think that's 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 the situation here I believe these were implemented in assembler uh, the catch is that uh, they depending on when the chip was actually purchased can be rather buggy uh, I think it was like twenty or so different revisions of this thing. So from the earliest A1 revision, which probably had more bugs than features, to the final C1 revision, which I, apparently has no bugs at all. So um, I, I, because we're changing this firmware uh, in, in this ROM here, 
there's a possibility that there are David's unit may contain a newer revision of this, and maybe some workarounds or bugs have been removed, or something else has changed. So I want to I want to get a picture of his um, his generator board, so we can see what revision this is and check if it's the same as mine. If he's got a newer one, I may have to yank mine out and and replace it. So anyway, that's uh, that's it for now. Um, I I said I'm going to send an email, and and if and when I get a response, we shall reconvene. Well, less than 24 hours later, I've received a really decent response here. He sent me a couple of screenshots from his oscilloscope. Um, we've got the carry signal here. And this one is, the falling edge of it is uh, 3.61 microseconds from the falling edge of horizontal sync. I checked mine, it's exactly the same. So the, the rollover of the counter hasn't changed. And that's, that's what I expected. I think that would be quite drastic to change the, the rollover of the counter like midway through the life of the product. But uh, the, this one here, LDCH off, this is different. And my hunch was this is the one we would find that was different. So on mine, the, uh, it sets, what's this here, uh, 1.18 microseconds after the falling edge of the horizontal sink, whereas he's measured um, the, something quite different. It's asserting 400, uh, was it, 355 nanoseconds before the falling edge of the horizontal sink. And uh, this would indicate to me that, uh, if we go back to the schematic here, um, so this went to this latch here, and on this side of it is the CPU, and this side is the generator circuitry. So what they seem to be doing is giving the CPU a little bit more time to supply these signals to the generator circuitry, and that's possibly because the it's a bit busier than it was before. Not really sure, and I'm not frankly, I'm not really going to dwell on it, but uh, I'm really glad that I've got this information because I think it would have been uh, really difficult to to guess what what would have changed just from experimentation. So anyway, what I did is uh, I, I basically disassembled the code from my pal and I've modified it so that I get this timing. And what I found is that when I do that, the checksum is 6D26, which is exactly what is printed on the top of his chip. So I'm so confident that I've recreated his code that I've actually affixed the Philips part number there. So that is that done. So here is the picture of his generator board, and that Dallas Speedit uh, is a revision A6, which is, uh, that's an exact match to mine. So uh, this is actually a very old and particularly buggy version of this, but uh, it doesn't really matter because it's going to have all the exact same bugs as the one that I have. So any software workarounds that are in place are still applicable. Now it is time for the not so fun part of this process, the actual upgrade. This is literally more than two hours of printing labels, programming chips, removing the old chips and inserting the new chips. As tedious as this is, upgrading the software in a 30 plus year old PM5644 is a rather special event, it has to be said, and to me, well worth spending the time on. Now, I know there's probably not going to be a whole lot of difference once it's done, but nonetheless I can't wait to see it. Now it is time for the exciting parts, powering it on with the new or more like 30 year old code. Now looking at the version number on here, we have version 1.1, which is, which is good, so it has been upgraded. Now for this test, I'm doing things a bit differently. Previously, I was connected to the composite output of this, which uh, that's why we had a bit of chroma noise in the pattern, but this time around, I've connected to the S video output or SVHS as it appears to be labeled on this, on this unit. Uh, which doesn't seem right, but whatever. Um, now looking at the test card, uh, straight away we can see that, that difference that I was expecting in that we have diagonal lines down here instead of that kind of checker pattern. But up here we still have the checker pattern where I was expecting to see diagonal lines. Now, I'm not really sure what the deal with this is, whether or not this is just a limitation of this decoder or if that is intentional. Now, I know that with Power Plus um, some horizontal resolution is sacrificed to do what it does, but which might explain this, but I'm not really sure. The, this decoder here I've read isn't isn't all that great. It was a first generation Power Plus decoder, and they did improve on them in subsequent years. I know Philips, at the very least, they did have a, an, an improved model which came out a few years later, um, which uh, I, I've never actually seen one for sale because by that time the Power Plus decoders would have been built into the television, so you wouldn't you wouldn't be buying one as a standalone unit. Um, but anyway, um, this is really cool to see this and. Straight away here, I can I can see what the ultimate difference between the software in my unit was versus what was in David's unit. So, mine is a mine is a lab test card, and his is a broadcast test card. 
Now, it's probably worth spending a minute to talk about the differences between these two, but rather than be hobbled by a power plus, I think what we'll do is put this equipment aside, and again, I'm going to get out some anamorphic generators so that we can actually have a look at the, the differences in the test cards in, in better detail. Well, here we are several weeks later, and I put together this little test setup, which is going to demonstrate what the differences between these test cards meant in practice. So we've got a minimal TV transmitter here, this modulator and up converter, and this is a system BG modulator, probably about as honest a implementation of system BG as you can get. And the reason I'm using this is because, well, that's what this test card was typically transmitted with, so it is, of course, absolutely applicable here. And we've got a couple of test pattern generators. Well, they actually are used for other things, but they are generating test patterns. And we've got our PT5210 here, which is, in the real world, just really just a sync generator. There were versions of this that could generate complex test cards, but they were only sold to select customers in 1997. So you will not find one on eBay that does this. I have more information about these in video number 10. Um, and this is generating the test card, which we see on screen right now. We also have this PM5655. Uh, this thing is a bit of a can of worms that we're not going to be opening today, but it's interesting because it generates the test card which my Power Plus generator came with, whereas this one is generating the test card that it has now. So the question that we're really trying to answer here is, why does a newer version of the test card have less detail in it than an old version? Well, we don't really know for sure, and the deal is that no technical information about this test card has ever actually been found. And you may have seen this diagram, which appears on the Wikipedia page, and as official as it looks, the thing you should know about it is that it is actually an enthusiast effort, and has been known to contain errors in the past. Now, I actually found a quote, uh, which I guess kind of tells us what the deal here is, in, and that is that in the early 1990s, there really was no market for widescreen pattern generators in broadcast. It really was just the TV manufacturing industry that, that wanted them whether that be in TV factories or in any you know, associated R&D labs and what have you. So let's have a look at the details of our PT5000 test card here, the same one that the Power Plus generator is now generating. And have a particular look at this here, the multiburst. So it starts at 800 kilohertz and then finishes at 4.8 megahertz, and that's in five steps. So if we switch over to the PM5655, we can see that it's a little bit different here. Now, there are actually some other differences in the test card, which I'm not going to get into, but what's particularly interesting here is, once again, we start at 800 kilohertz, but now we finish at 5.8 megahertz. So there's this extra step on here. You will often see it written that widescreen analog TV doesn't have any additional horizontal resolution. It's just simply all of the detail that is already there, just stretched out. Well, that isn't necessarily true. In situations like this, where we are connected directly via composite videos, for example, actually there is a little bit more resolution. And generally speaking, there is an extra megahertz or so of bandwidth, which allows for, of course, more resolution. Now, how much more bandwidth there is really depends on the manufacturer of the television. But generally speaking, there is an extra megahertz. And that is really what that is there to test. Towards the late 1990s, the market for this sort of equipment changed. It transitioned away from the TV manufacturing industry, more towards broadcast. And in that situation, the requirements for these test cards would have shifted. And let me give you an example of this. So what I'm going to do is switch the TV from the composite output here to the output of this modulator. So what we're going to do is basically see what these looked like on air. So let me just go through and do that now. So if we look at that last grating here, the one that's at 5.8 megahertz, notice that it is now disappeared and it's just a gray smudge. And the reason for this is because the bandwidth for PowerBG is 5 megahertz, whereas that tone is 5.8 megahertz, so it's, it's exceeding the, the bandwidth for PowerBG, which is, you know, as I said, pretty much all that this is going to be transmitted with. So what this really amounts to is basically just a wasted bit of space on the test card. There's this signal which is being generated that nobody will ever receive. So if we switch back to our PT5210, well, we can see that the gratings now finish at 4.8 megahertz, which is all that anybody is ever going to be able to receive. So at least that space is now filled with useful signals. So anyway, there you have it. And as I said, these really are just my thoughts. I haven't actually ever found any documentation which says this definitively. 
Well, that is all for today's video. And a big thanks to David for making this possible. I actually have a range of different programmers and with them I can read and write just about any integrated circuit imaginable and I actually offer a service free of charge to anybody to do just that. I really enjoy hearing the stories about the different types of vintage equipment that people are restoring and repairing and certainly value them more than money. I was recently in contact with a musician who had a rare vintage instrument which was key to his performances but unfortunately a failure in the power supply had damaged all of the integrated circuits within it. Now fortunately in his situation there was actually somebody else out there who had dumped the code out of that instrument and that meant that with my help it was able to be restored to full working order and that was just really satisfying and certainly he was very thankful for that. And I would say this of anybody who has anything rare out there, dump the code out of the chips, make it available to others, because people who do this kind of thing will be much more positively remembered than people who keep things to themselves. Anyway, that is all. Thanks for watching.